Good evening, I'm Kathy Lewis. It's good to be with you on Friday night, Public Affairs Night on WHRO TV 15 and Digital 15-1. Joining the Friday night lineup with programs like Washington Week, Bill Moyer's Journal, Now, and Tavis Smiley, we knew we had to bring you a show worth your time, a show about issues that aren't getting their due elsewhere. In short, we knew we had to bring you a show about what matters. Some of our conversations will focus on a moment in time and its meaning and context. Such a moment came last month at the College of William and Mary when the embattled President Gene Nickel announced his immediate resignation. Tonight, a conversation with Gene Nickel. First, Lisa Godley has a look at the timeline of Gene Nickel's presidency. Gene Nickel grasped the reins as the 26th president of the College of William and Mary in July of 2005. Four months prior, the Board of Visitors had chosen the William and Mary law professor by unanimous vote. Nickel wasted no time bringing about change. On August 26, less than two months at the helm, he announced Gateway, an aggressive scholarship program that would ensure more lower-income students could get their degrees from the College of William and Mary. Nichols' decision-making was questioned in October 2006 when he decided to remove the Wren Cross from the chapel where it had been permanently displayed for decades. He defended his decision as an attempt to make people of all religions feel included during events held in the facility. Five months later, in March of 2007, a presidential committee chose to return the cross to Wren Chapel as an artifact in a glass case with a plaque explaining its historical significance. In February of 2008, a Another controversy when Nickel announced a sex workers art show to take place on campus. In a letter to the William and Mary community, Nickel said, quote, to stop production because I found it offensive or unappealing would have violated both the First Amendment and the traditions of openness and inquiry that sustain great universities. Four days later, on February 8th, the Board of Visitors decided that Nichols' contract would not be renewed and informed Nickel of their decision two days later. On February 12th, Gene Nickel resigned. And Gene Nickel joins us tonight on What Matters. Thanks very much for being with us tonight. Uh, it's good to see you, Kathy. I know you've had lots of opportunities to talk. I'm guessing your phone has <laughs> fairly rung off, rung off the hook yeah. uh, in the wake of, uh, one, of what's one happened. One doesn't want for opportunities to talk. <laughs> Indeed. Right. So I'm wondering why you decided to accept this opportunity. Well, uh, for one thing, uh, I have great regard for you, and uh, uh, I think you uh, do a terrific job. Uh, uh, I agreed to do this some time ago, as, as you know. I must admit that I thought uh, the controversies over my presidency would have uh, sort of fallen more silent uh, by now. Uh, the, the, the truth of it is, though, um, I, I tell you, watching that uh, uh, intro, uh, there's the, you know, the Chinese saying of may you live in interesting times, I'm, I'm not sure I haven't led in, lived in times too interesting or interesting enough. Um, I, I explained uh, and felt compelled to uh, when I resigned uh, uh, why I made that unusual decision. Uh, I explained that I had not been renewed and uh, that I was going to resign immediately. Uh, I indicated as clearly as I could, I, I hope as thoughtfully as I could, uh, why I thought that happened, why I believe that happened, why I still believe that happened. Uh, why I was taking the further step of uh, resigning uh, immediately. Uh, I thought I owed that to the university community that I care uh, so much about. Uh, and uh, there's been a lot of discussion about it. I, uh, God knows uh, from many, many different directions. I don't have, frankly, uh, a lot to add to that. Uh, what I, what is important to me now, or what I am uh, focusing on now, uh, much more powerfully, as I prepare to leave uh, William and Mary and leave uh, Williamsburg. Uh, my wife and I have accepted appointments at uh, the University of North Carolina, which is something of a homecoming for us. Uh, but as that comes close and I think about the remarkable students and faculty members and staff members that I've worked with over these uh, last three years, the really singular character of the institution of the College of William and Mary and how much I'm going to miss it, um, what uh, working with them has meant to me. Uh, 
you know, to tell you the truth, I'm much more moved to think and talk about that uh, than uh, these other matters. Now, that poses the dilemma that uh, I guess I'm in the bad position of being interesting for one reason or set of reasons and interested in another, and that's, yeah. uh, uh, that's a challenge. But uh, uh, thinking now about leaving uh, the college, um, and thinking also about what a singular place uh, it is. That, those are the largest matters on my mind right mm -hmm. now. And I, and I promise we'll talk about those because mm -hmm. there's some important points to be made around that. Um, yesterday there was a letter released um, uh, by the Board of Visitors indicating that the decision around your future was around performance uh, and not around ideology. And so as you watched that tape and as you think about this latest development this week, um, what do you want people to know about the last 12 to 16 months or so? <laughs> that's a, that's a, a long uh, question, uh, or at least one calling for a long uh, answer. Um, I, I know there are these uh, uh, disagreements or arguments about the reason for my uh, departure. I have uh, said very clearly what I believe those reasons uh, were, and I still uh, believe that. Uh, so. I likely uh, don't agree with the uh, the, the verdicts as uh, presented, uh, but the the important thing now, it seems to me, but for me personally, uh, uh, I am excited and enthusiastic about the the work that I think I will uh, be able to do in the years ahead for the college, uh, which is of course much more important. Uh, the the carrying forward of a set of vital uh, issues and interests there. Uh, which I'm, I'm very hopeful will happen. I really hope that it does. Uh, I think that's the, uh, the most crucial thing. Uh, the, the, the future uh, for these young women and men, the, the strength of the faculty uh, at the college. I have thought for a long time that the major part of my job was trying to help these young women and men understand uh, the that their horizons can be expanded uh, mm -hmm. to, to sort of change their view of the possible. Uh, and I think uh, we had at least some uh, success in that. Uh, I think that is the potent goal of uh, uh, higher education. It's its challenge uh, and its marvelous uh, legacy. Uh, and um, when I think about what these young women and men will be able to accomplish, what this uh, really um, distinctive faculty in terms of its culture of uh, teaching through research, which is uh, a real hallmark of the mm -hmm. College of William and Mary. Uh, it can leave one optimistic, but also, you know, modestly heartbroken uh, for me. Uh, I'm going to miss them very much. I'm going to miss uh, the people who live, work, study, and teach uh, at the College of William and Mary are a remarkable assemblage, uh, one that has had a larger impact on me, I think, than anything, certainly in my professional life. Uh, so uh, I, I'm full of sadness uh, about leaving them, but uh, wishing this institution all the, the great challenge uh, that it deserves, all the great possibility that it deserves, and I know what will be all the great accomplishment that it, uh, it deserves. So. Uh, those are my principal responses. Yeah, I think. and it's been very interesting to watch the response that's come out of you. You talked about the students. Uh, they're sort of all over the map, but you, the one thing you come away with is that these are very bright men and women who are able to articulate their positions pretty well, whatever their positions are. Uh, and, and so it, it does sort of uh, lead one to believe that there is um, a, a lot of intellectual rigor going on at the College of William and Mary. An unbelievable amount. Yeah. And uh, I think that uh, what the students at William and Mary can give you a great deal of faith about the future itself, just like uh, you said, Kathy, about, about this generation. Uh, and most pointedly, a great deal of uh, faith for the future of the college mm -hmm. itself and the attainment of the college. I was a law school dean for a long time before I became a university president, and I've always had strong, uh, close working relationships with the uh, students in law school. Um, but it's a little different in law school. Uh, they are uh, preparing to enter a profession, they are looking for mentors, but it's a more, uh, uh, more discreet uh, process. Um, 
the relationship which can exist between a university president, at least at a small, intimate place like the College of William and Mary and undergraduates, I'm not sure I knew what I was getting into on that uh, front, but it is remarkable and astonishing. I wouldn't, I don't think I could encapsulate very easily what it is. If law students are looking for mentors to enter a profession, uh, undergraduates are engaged in a much more uh, unwieldy uh, mm. endeavor. <laughs> but um, I tell you what, uh, uh, the, the, the inspiration which uh, uh, I think I enjoyed at the at the hands of uh, working with the students of the College of William Mary's is, is like nothing I've ever seen before. I'm imagining that um, the the uh, the support that you the, the very uh, specific and, and and dramatic support you got from a lot of members of the student body um, had to be a comfort in what was uh, by any read of the uh, email and internet traffic on this a pretty horrifying. A personal moment for you and and, and for your family. I, it was, I was really struck by um, by by the viciousness of some yeah. of the commentary yeah. around this. Yeah. It seemed to have crossed a line, or uh, I, it seemed to. Well, have... You wouldn't get a disagreement from me on that. <laughs> I, you know, like. A, I don't uh, mean crossed a line in the sense that uh, what, what I mean is it's it seemed to have been something that really uh, was not something we're accustomed to seeing around these kinds of yeah, issues. Yeah. I, it, involvement in a strong controversy like this or series uh, of controversies has uh, complicated results. Um, one of which you, you just mentioned, that is the, the strength of support that uh, my family and I received uh, from the student body, uh, from the faculty, from the staff, uh, and really, frankly, I think for most alumni, uh, was among the most uh, touching uh, uh, experiences of, of my life. The, the night uh, of my resignation, I, you've seen that. There were, I don't know what it was, a couple thousand students on the doorstep. William Mary's not a large place, so that's a pretty uh, uh, remarkable feat. And the, uh, even the continuing experiences we've had on uh, the campus uh, since then have been uh, sort of soul uh, uh, satisfying, mm. uh, I, I have to say. It's also true, as, as your question indicates, that there have been uh, some, uh, a dark side of this. There has been uh, viciousness in uh, these uh, issues, um, which uh, I wouldn't have anticipated, or I hadn't seen uh, anything like that before. Uh, it's uh, it's it's complicated to comment on it. I'm obviously immensely biased about uh, commenting on it. I will, and I, I don't think, as you said, did it cross the line? Well, it's hard to tell where such a line is when you're a public figure and uh, you take on these uh, public uh, roles and missions. You do it knowingly and willingly, uh, which I did. I, I'd say if you have a hard time drawing a line generally, uh, you could easily draw the line that, look, you don't, you don't do this to the, the kids and uh, the family. Um, uh, they didn't take on this. Uh, but it's one thing to take you on, sure. quite another thing to take on That's your right. wife and your children. That's right. Yeah. I decided uh, to accept the offer to become the president of the College of William and Mary. Uh, uh, my wife didn't do that. My daughters didn't do that. Uh, so I think surely you could draw a line there. Um, uh, I know there's a theory for that, that is if you're trying to sort of run the guy out and uh, make, make things so miserable that you want to leave on your own, then uh, that's what you do. But I think you could conclude that that's unworthy, uh, even if we have a hard time drawing a line about the rest. As you think about uh, college presidents, the college presidency business and that role. One of the things we know from the research from folks in the field says that uh, we will see increasingly shorter tenures for college presidents, that we will see situations where college presidents will have multiple presidencies during their career instead of one from which they retire. Uh, so I wonder from this unique vantage point, what advice would you have for other people who find themselves entertaining the possibility of a college search or who find themselves thinking this is something they'd like to do? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't. Maybe that's I'm the book. The, I'm, not the, I'm not the person to offer advice on that. <laughs> and I think I'm also not the person to uh, kind of make, to draw broad conclusions about the uh, uh, future of university presidencies. I'm, 
Uh, I have worked for a long time in, in a lot of different uh, ventures uh, on sets of issues that are close to my heart, that I believe in very uh, powerfully. Um, I realized even earlier in life that sometimes doing that, uh, sometimes uh, pressing hard on matters uh, which you think are of vital importance, will create both wonderful friends and very uh, powerful and uh, uh, enthusiastic and energetic uh, adversaries. Uh, uh, I've, I've uh, you could sort of paraphrase this old Ibsen quote, when you go out to fight for justice or your vision of justice, don't wear your best trousers. And uh, uh, I, I, I understand uh, uh, in that uh, determination that there are uh, difficulties and that I'd, I've, I've, Frank Porter Graham, who was a, a, a great uh, president of the University of North Carolina, said that he had paid the cost of having taken sides. Mm. Um, uh, and I, there is something to that. Um, my own view is, um, the alternative is withdrawing from uh, the important matters and issues of the day, uh, refusing to take a position on anything, uh, uh, administering by never annoying anyone, uh, never taking uh, 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 a discernible position on any uh, vital matter. And I, you know, I'm one who thinks that's not an effective uh, uh, method of leadership, but uh, I would advise anyone who's uh, uh, considering a university presidency to talk of a whole lot of people before they talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> uh. One of the things that uh, that certainly happened in this in this circumstance, and and I suspect uh, at least there's a lot of conversation in the larger community about the fear of this thing happening with increasing regularity, is the situation that occurred when members of the General Assembly requested uh, a visit from those whose board terms were about board of visitors terms were about to be renewed, uh, and they were some pretty pointed remarks related to you and related to other issues as well. Uh, going they liked me, didn't they? Didn't they? Were, were they supportive? <laughs> No, okay. apparently not. Oh, okay. uh, right. But but I but I wonder: Are we going to see more of that in in your view across the country as we look at these issues of uh, public universities? Well, I hope not. It's a real challenge uh, for public universities. I'm in a complicated position on this as one who has worked in public universities, uh, one who is committed from the core to public universities and public mission. Uh, who has uh, uh, decided not to uh, go the private route, even when uh, generously requested, because the, the notion of great world-class public universities is so crucial uh, in, in a vibrant democracy. Um, there are pros and cons <laughs> with, with regard to public universities. Uh, to me, uh, they are the crux of our future. Uh, part of that is uh, a sense of uh, uh, maybe democratic theory on my part. M much of it has to do with my own story, I think. Uh, uh, I, as an administrator, uh, my uh, strongest goal has been the belief that we need to have not just private universities, but public universities compete at the highest levels of the American Academy. Public universities, with all that entails, questions of access and equality, questions of public obligation, uh, trying to do things like we've done so remarkably at the College of William and Mary uh, in engaging uh, the student body and the, the uh, curriculum uh, in the broad uh, felt needs of the community that sustains us. I am a, sort of an, ad an advocate of public higher education uh, to the bottom of my feet. Uh, public education, however, uh, opens a set of other uh, challenges. Uh, that means you're going to deal with legislatures, uh, and sometimes legislatures are going to uh, be congenial in terms of traditional academic uh, independence, and you know maybe sometimes uh, they won't. Uh, I think, generally speaking, um, our future is in strong, committed life-changing public higher education. Uh, it makes it a complicated course. I'm sure that private higher education has its own challenges sure. in terms of uh, interference, but uh, uh, the academy is not well served by uh, political interference of this sort, but uh, 
your support comes from legislatures, and legislators are political folks, and they always will be, and that's no great surprise to anyone. Necessary tension, one yeah. supposes. As a constitutional scholar, and I know that's a, a great passion for you and certainly the focus of so much of your, your research and your teaching, um, as you look abroad in the land, uh, and this is another one that would take another half an hour, I mm -hmm. just warn you about that ahead right. of time, uh, where do you see the greatest uh, threat or challenge to constitutional rights? Uh, just look across the spectrum, and if we were sitting in your law class, mm -hmm. what would you be talking about? Well, of course, uh, in a whole different realm, there are great threats or concerns, understandable concerns, yeah. to be candid about constitutional liberties uh, post September 11th. Uh, the demand, the tension between security and freedom uh, is and remains uh, at, at a complex point uh, in our history. Uh, I think uh, that traditional notions of uh, equality, the, uh, the open American door uh, mm. to equal opportunity, uh, uh, is still at the heart of many of our largest problems. Uh, an, a, an issue of particular focus for me, and I hope for the nation, uh, I certainly have been looking at this for over a decade, is the concern that we too easily, as a society, turn our gaze away. I, I like that phrase. I used to be friends with Paul Wellstone, and that's sort of how he would describe it. We turn our gaze away from those locked at the bottom, mm. economically particularly, of American life. Uh, and that has very potent and troubling ramifications in the justice system, in education, both K-12, where we have sort of rich and poor public schools even, in higher education, in health care, uh, in the way we uh, live uh, uh, in gated communities versus uh, uh, living together in the strength of a public sector. In politics, uh, the relationship between money and politics. So, for me, the, the our willingness uh, in law, in culture, in literature, in our academic study to turn our gaze away from those who are having the most difficult time because of economic barriers is not consistent with what we say we are as Americans. Uh, I think other nations perhaps don't talk so much about equality and mm. opportunity. Um, we talk a lot about it and we don't always do uh, as good a job in carrying through as we should. So I think those are among the most profound issues that we face in the future. Uh, Gene Nicola, I want to thank you for joining us. It's been a pleasure talking with you and uh, may we look for you to be in the running for the presidency of UNC or for now as the faculty. Uh, I am going to the University of North Carolina to teach uh, and to write. Uh, I will likely uh, uh, do some work on these issues uh, that I uh, describe. Uh, so uh, I am uh, I'm not a candidate uh, in the chancellor search. I have a near lust to work on issues that I care about and that I've been working on for a long time under my own pace, uh, with my own uh, uh, desired depth and attention. Uh, and without having to worry so much about what the fellow next door may be thinking about what I'm, <laughs> what I'm thinking. So uh, I look forward to that very much. My wife, by the way, has just uh, received a, uh, a Fulbright. Uh, oh, fantastic. Uh, for, uh, so she'll be going to China in the spring, and wow. I'm going to be chasing her back and forth a little bit. So well, we sure wish you we all well. That. Thank you so Thank much. You. Well, Gene Nickel and his family are clearly ready to move on, and I certainly respect that. They have been, uh, there have been so many loud voices on this issue, from those calling in very personal ways for Nichols' departure to the voices of students who are inspired by his ideals. But there's a softer voice that you couldn't hear as well, and that's the voice of the Reverend Holly Hollerith, the rector, the minister of Bruton Parish. That's on Duke of Gloucester Street, about a stone's throw from the college campus there. It was the Reverend Hollerith who noted that crosses weren't part of Anglican altars when the college was built. In fact, it wasn't until 1909 that Bruton got its own cross for its altar. Thirty years later, when they got a new one, they gave the old one to the students at the Wren Chapel, where it's believed it was left there for convenience. In other words, said the Reverend Hollerith, the cross became a permanent object in Wren Chapel simply by accident. 
And so while Gene Nickel has freely admitted his handling of the Wren Cross episode might have been better, the beginning of the end was apparently an episode of majoring in minors, or at least that's how I see it. Now that the damage has been done, the search for a successor will begin this fall. What is needed is a relentlessly reflective, rigorous, transparent process to find a leader who will keep the college curious, engaging, challenging, and significant. It's a big job, and it probably won't leave much time for running to Richmond when some lawmakers don't like something they see on campus. And that is probably a very good thing. Well, we want to know what uh, matters to you. So maybe you have a thought about this week's broadcast or a suggestion for a future show. Just send us an email at whatmatters at whro.org. You can also call us at 889-9437. Or you can write to us at WHRO 5200 Hampton Boulevard, Norfolk, Virginia 235. Zero 08. Thanks for being with us on our inaugural broadcast next Friday night, a conversation about the region's dwindling transportation options. All that and more next Friday on What Matters. Thanks for being with us.